Are we still on the table? Yeah. Oh, we're going? Yeah. He is a 14-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, an eight-time Bassmaster winner, a two-time Bassmaster Angler of the Year, the 1999 Bassmaster Classic champion, a former FLW Tour Championship winner, a Bass Fishing Hall of Famer, and a dude I love to work with. This week, Davey Height joins me on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks, humpers. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. This is a very special mobile Mercer, and that's when you're going to expect a Harley to drive down the road when you're doing a very special mobile Mercer. It's episode 150. I hope you're all having a great week. We are on the shores pseudo shores of Lake Fork. We just left Toledo Bend. What a freaking incredible opening tournament. Koya Fujita is a, it's ridiculous. He's really, we need to ban him because he's ruining the sport. Never mind banning forward facing sonar, ban Koya. He has fished 10 elite series events. He has finished in the top six, or top 10, six times. See the numbers, they all get jumbled to me at times. But he has won two of those. And he's got two century belts. It's absolutely ridiculous. Maybe the hottest start in Elite Series history. We don't have a lot of bandwidth because this is a mobile show, so I'm going to fire through it. We're going to talk a lot about that tournament next week with Jake's Take. There's a lot of changing times in the fishing world. It was talked about all season long. That it's an arms race. Well, the arms race was seen on the Elite Series and, and all the MLF and all the tours. See, I said it, and I didn't even beep it out. We can get along. <laughs> One thing I do need to talk about before we go into this week's show, all the people that just got announced, inducted in the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame, absolutely awesome. Zona, Mike McInnes, Skeet Reese, Fred Arbergast, and Alfred Williams, all very worthy. Obviously, um, Zona and Mike are just very near and dear to my heart. I wouldn't have my job at Bass without Zona. He is one of my dearest friends and, and I think a gift to our sport. There's no way our sport would be where it is if we didn't have Mark Zona. And as far as our sport being where it is, Mike McKinnis invented friggin' live bass fishing. I mean, he was the one that said, yes, yes, we can do this for eight hours a day and it doesn't matter where we go. And um, now obviously it's the standard. So congrats, boys. I'm happy for all of you. Um, I think that's all I got. Except what I do have is a freaking awesome show. Davey Height, it's weird. When I did that pre-roll and said how much he's accomplished, I work with him. He's a buddy. And sometimes because he's so down to earth and so cool, you, you forget the freaking legend that he is. And um, this conversation, it's literally right after the tournament. We just sat down. We had a couple of energy drinks because we had to keep our energy up. And we talked, and, and I asked Davey, be real, because Davey, such a polished, incredible, accomplished pro, but there's a lot of stuff, amazing stories about Davey that he hardly ever tells, and he tells a few stories during this conversation that he's never told publicly. So I would say, now mind you, this is technically the worst show ever, the best worst show ever, because um, we start with a beautiful sunset, it gets dark, and by the end of it, it's kind of a Blair Fish project lit by my cell phone light. But he lights up my life every time I get to work with him, the legendary Mr. Davey Hyde. Davey, does this make me a really good friend or a really bad friend that I'm making you work after work? This isn't work. <laughs> Hanging out with you, drinking a beer is not work to me. I know it is you because this is part of the way you make your living and build your brand and all that, but it's not work to me. It's not really work. Just ask my family whenever they, sorry, if I was professional, I would have dealt with that beforehand. My family says, are you tired from talking? You had a long weekend, you talked. <laughs> I don't really work. <laughs> right. Now, I will say that uh, when I talk to Natalie at the end of the day, at the end of the tournament, that uh, she's really excited to get to talk to me. She's been at home alone most times, and she's real talkative. I'm like, I, I don't need to talk quite so much right now. So It's weird. Like, I do that too, and it's weird because all your friends, all they want to do is what happened here how big was and i'm just like uh, <laughs> i've talked about fish for a while right. but it's 
I will say this. Everybody at the beginning of the season, and I'm sure you're the same, and you heard everybody on the dock, and they're like, thank God it's back. Like, you know, thank God. But yeah. I'm a weirdo where I love home, too. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, like, I literally, before I left, I was like, I could have used another month. But then you come here, and you're like, frick, this is the best. Like, especially yesterday's yeah. weigh-in. It's, yeah. it's what we live for, you know, in one part of our life. But what I really live for with my family, just like you're saying. Yeah. Um, but it's... It's, it's really cool what we saw yesterday and the number one question I get from people is do you miss fishing yeah and I'm like I fish as much as I ever have I fish a lot but but there is yeah, there I part of you that yeah. Yeah, I would miss it if I wasn't there yeah I'm going to miss one day I won't be there um so if I was sitting home this week I'd miss it, and, and maybe I'd want to jump back in the lease. Maybe I'd, but but it's. Uh, I feel like I'm a a big part of. It. I'm not competing, and and I'm probably a small part of it. But I'm I'm. Uh, I feel like I'm. Like I've been for the last yeah. 25, 30 years. So. Especially going on the water, I think though. Oh Because yeah, you yeah. you become 100%. 100%. you're 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 no part of somebody's victory, but just being there. Oh, yeah. There's a weird like special connection. I can think of uh, several times that I feel connected to the person, and and I don't know why, but certain certain times, and, and some people show their emotions more than others. Yeah. But I remember Carl Jacobson on Ten Killer. Uh, I remember Brian New on St. John's. Um, you know, Kioya just won, and. For some reason, I think we connect a little bit, and and, and he probably doesn't. <laughs> but um, you know, he's he's very good at what he does. He's very focused. He's a hard worker. He's you know all the things that we appreciate. Is and we talked about it on live today. Is it the? I mean, I wouldn't say in Bassmaster history because you really got to dig deep. But right. but Elite Series history, it has to be the hardest. Hottest start. Like, I know it's early, but yeah. he's fished 10 Elite yeah. Series events, yeah. two Century Belts, two Elite Series titles, six. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Six top tens. It is, it, it, to my knowledge, in the Elite Series and, and maybe the history of the sport. Roland, you got to think about what Roland well, did back yeah. in the day. And, and he, he, would be the, elites. he would be the one you'd have to really look at because yeah. he, he was that dominant uh, when he started fishing bass. But other than that, yeah, and then Elites for sure. Nobody's even close. Ten events. Uh huh. What five top tens and two wins? Or six, six top tens. Yeah. yeah. Two of those are wins. Come on, get you two seven. century belts. Yeah. And and so today, you know, something happened too. Um, this, you know, the the elephant in the room is Ford facing. Yep. And one thing I hear people say, and and. I want to be clear that I don't know the answer. I don't know whether it should stay, whether it shouldn't stay. I have, I have, I have a lot of reasons to say that I don't think it's good for the sport because of the allure of the unknown. But what I hear a lot of people say, it's not fishing. There's no skill to it. So I guess Kioya has a two, three rabbit, you know, a dozen rabbit feet in his, you know, the, the good luck charm of a four leaf clover and a, and a rabbit foot in, in both pockets you know because truly there is some skill and there, a lot there, yes so you know I don't know and I, I shouldn't have even opened that up but honestly it's uh, it's impressive what he's done I think it's because it's technology and again we talked about this a lot but it, because it's technology everybody says it's technology and they but it's no different than watching Hackney fish a jig or Jason Christie fish a spinnerbait along cypress trees. Jason Christie, the average person, they see that same thing Jason Christie sees. And they stop and they kind of line up their cast and then they get it in there. Maybe they miss it, maybe they... But, but by the time they're all doing that, Jason Christie has already set the hook on the fish. Right. Because it's instantaneous. And that's... Right. To me, that's what it's like watching Kyoya. Like, everybody makes a big deal of his baits, but it's... 
there's no guessing like I mean I do it I go out with that stuff and I'm like okay the boats it's 60 feet the boats 20 I need three of these and you do your quick yeah. but he is it's instantaneous so you get great friends with Kevin uh-huh and and I am also where I'm waiting for 12 years I think it's for so many years and so many of my friends I had to tell over and over again he does not have secret base yeah you'd be amazed how many baits that he pulls right out of the package and ties on that you could buy at you know, your local tackle store. It's 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 not so much, but but we all think that is. Uh, yeah. And and I, I want a secret bait as much as anyone. You actually asked him for one on stage today, didn't you? <laughs> but um, he he he's got some. But he's so detailed. He's so precise. He. He's focused. I, I I can't have anything but respect for someone like you. Yeah. Probably motivated some people this week, though. People that don't like forward facing sure. sonar. I get it. I get it. So Lee Levasey, good friends of uh, me and you, asked me. I don't know if it's Wednesday or Thursday. What would you do if you were here? And he wasn't asking for information. Yeah. It was like because we were talking about the forward facing stuff. It was that he was like, would you? Like go to the bank or, or BFD. It wasn't you know, some kind of rule violation. He didn't want to know my secret base because I don't have any. But I said I would be in trouble because I would know that half of the top ten. It turns out all ten of the top ten were four fish. Yeah. But but it would be so hard for me not to go to the bank and fish what I've done my whole life, and I've been here multiple times over twenty five years. A lot of times, and I came here in the off season and, and fished. I've seen it low. I came here when it was, you know, historically low and made waypoints. Um, so I've I've spent a lot of time here on this lake. So it, I, I don't know if I could just go out. You know, they weren't in the middle of the lake, but they were in the middle of a big creek for the most part. A lot of people. I don't know that I could do that, but but everything would tell me if you want to be competitive, you better try to go do it. Yeah. How do you, anyway, I would try to do both, and I would not do good. How do you think you would have navigated the... I mean, if you stayed fishing, how do you think you would have navigated the forward-facing sonar? Like, do you, I mean, is it any different now? Would you have... It's weird, it, it, because yeah. it's like... Yeah. It's almost... Rick Klein said about flipping. He said when D. Thomas came and did it, People wanted it outlawed. People, you know, because it's technology, people think it's different. But it's a you do hear a lot of Lee, prime example in prefish. He said there's big ones out there, but I don't want to do it. Which, yeah. So I can give you my answer, but it's always I'm somebody that thinks to give an answer when you're really not put in that scenario yeah. can can be a little. But I'll give you my best answer. I've thought about it a lot because, obviously, like I said, this is the gorilla in the room right now. Um, and for some reason, I thought about when I was 12 years old, and I know I was 12 years old. I can remember this like it was yesterday. I didn't, you know, my family, I didn't have enough money that my dad or my granddad would buy me a flipping stick. And flipping was kind of like a hot thing that came yeah. out. I read about it in Bassmaster Magazine. And we'd stop by... My dad was a fisherman, my granddad was a fisherman, but they were not necessarily bass fishermen. They were like what we call meat fishermen, you know, just, just, you know. And I think that helped me become a, a good fisherman because I fished for all species yeah. as a child. But I, for some reason, was attracted to, to bass fishing and, and the guys that had bass boats and stuff like that. My dad and my granddad didn't at the time. And my dad never really owned a bass boat, but... I can remember stopping by a tackle shop, and the guy that owned it was a tournament bass fisherman at the time, and he knew, he kind of saw, he, he saw that I just really loved it, and he had a flipping stick, first one I ever saw, and like the second time we went by there, he said, here, take this, I'm like, what? He didn't give it to me, but he said, keep it for a week and I'll get it back for you. I can't go fishing until next week, and I know you're on the water every day. And I was on Lake Murray every single day. And I took, because I read about a flipping stick and the, the technique, and I took it, and I went fishing with it. And the very 
first bite I ever got with a flipping stick and a jig at 12 or 13 years old was a six pounder. Dang. I read about it. I knew it was something I should learn and it, it got my attention. Said all that to say I can see the exact same thing happening with young fishermen now. Um, so I understand what, you know, it's kind of if you want to get better, you've got to do it. But this is a different deal. It's not a flipping stick. And I hear people try to, well, they, they wanted to outlaw flipping. They wanted to outlaw this and that. They did outlaw the Alabama. They, but this is a whole different deal. It's, it's, it's way bigger than that. And, and that's what I think some people don't understand. It's, it's way bigger than that. Because what we're seeing now, those companies, you know, Humminbird, Lawrence, Garmin, they are, they're all ahead of that already, developing the next technology. Yeah. They're, they're way ahead of it. And it overrules everything. Like yeah. when it's happening, or at least now. Yeah. And that's why I think older anglers are having a hard time. Because yeah. they know. They know too much. You can't erase. Yeah. Like Christy yeah. said it the other night. He yeah. said, if I can erase 30 years of instinct telling me to go to the bank and do this. Because he's 80% of his success has come from actually power yeah. fishing. Yeah. So that's what he wants to do. Well, these young guys, 80% of their success, because of the time, not because that's the only thing they can do, yeah. but because of the time, that allows them to have, it's Jason Christie's power fishing. Yeah. It, it, it does, and because we're at Toledo Bend, I guess this comes to mind more than it, it would if we were somewhere else, but I have the utmost respect for Tommy Martin. Yeah. I mean, I, I really, really, really do. So, you know, he was a rock star that I read about in Bassmaster Magazine, and when I got to meet him and be around him a little bit, certainly no letdown. Hard worker, focused, very smart guy, and... Yeah, I was in my first or second year fishing Bassmaster, and I'd read of it, and then I was around him, and I would just hear him talking. He had a very strong voice, yeah. and just you know, wasn't afraid for other people to hear him talking about why this and that. And I can remember being a rookie or or maybe second year fishing Bassmaster, and thinking, I really thought this. He knows more. He has forgot probably forgotten more than I will ever know about this sport. But then I also knew at that time it's like he's overthinking it. He's overthinking it. He he's he's got so much knowledge that he he's falling back on and I think that's what happens here. There's and and that's why I told Lee the other day, I would not do good here because I would not be able to resist going to the bank and throwing, you know, a, a jig or you know, whatever, you know, the, the power fishing stuff. I, I wouldn't so I would be stuck because I, w I would know that I have to do this other thing because it's probably going to win. And if you don't even try to do what you think is going to be the technique to win, then what are you doing even out there? Yeah. And I would be trying to do both. And I'd probably finish, you know, 80th. It, it's, I've never seen this kind of, un you know what I mean? Like, and I get it from anglers. Like, there's an unrest. Like, it's... It is. It, it is. it is. Is there ever been anything in your career that you should, like? What can you compare it to? Nothing. Nothing. That's why I mentioned that people say, "Well, they tried to ban this. They tried to ban this. They did ban that." I think tr if if they made it legal to troll in our tournaments, it would have a small impact. If they did ban forward facing, it'd make a big impact. I mean, I. I you know, live bait. I'm not so sure. And that's that's a stretch. Yeah. I'm not so sure a night crawler would be more lethal than forward facing sonar right now. Do you think yeah. if, if uh, this field could all use night crawlers this week, ten out of ten they would take the forward of facing the top sonar. ten. Yeah. Like, John Cox is the only buddy the only guy <laughs> picking up yeah. this bucket of worms. So do you think I mean there's no way the top ten would all be, you know, using night crawlers like we had today. They the top ten was all using forward facing. We're working over here, Crawford. We're making a podcast, okay? <laughs> Andy Crawford, Bassmaster photographer. As you can hear, a man of few words. I mean, I'm just watching the Bassmaster. Okay, that's fine. Watch, watch. We have a live audience for the first time on this shitty podcast. We have a live audience. 
<laughs> no, it's... I, I'm not going to say it's like some other term or trail might have that many people in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Now it's you're certainly not calling what, what term or trail it is. This is the debut height the world needs to see. <laughs> I say anything. I said, no. I, I said I'm not going to say it. All right. Say All right. Um... I mean, what? it really did kind of sound like some of the other <laughs> things we see, didn't it? Yeah. Did you see how scared Jordan Lee was this week? <laughs> so why do you bring him up? Did that bring to mind? Well, no, because he just, I mean, his little boy was very unrestful on the stage. And I don't think he's used to such yeah. people. Simple people being around there. <laughs> yeah, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. Hey, I'm glad to have Jordan back. Jordan yeah. is, is obviously... You know, his resume speaks for itself. I don't have to say anything about that, but he's a good guy, too. And, and good to see him as a dad now. Yeah. I And I don't want to start. It's five years ago, I think everybody made their choice or whatever, but I still think that's one of the, it's messed up. That, like, literally you take that collection of anglers and you put them in a Bass Pro Shops. You put them in a Cabela's. You put them in a Piggly Wiggly. And you say, they're going to do seminars next Saturday. That group, there's there's three laps around that building waiting to see them. Yeah. And as much as everybody looks at two companies that have, obviously they're rivaling each other and, and you know, looking for their space. The fans chose not to. Yeah. It's wild. It, it is, um, but... I think we all learned, if you paid attention to all that, that it's it's the shield, it's the the fish itself, and the fans are loyal to, you know, Ray Scott. Or, you know, the the brand that has been there, you know, through through thick and thin, and names and 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 players, athletes, whatever you want to call it, pros, they'll come and go in any sport. They really, really will. Me included. Yeah. I, I came and went. Um, but fans, you know, gosh, just, and, and we've talked about this. The first tournament in 2018 at St. John's River, and I'm an old man. I don't cry about a lot. But when I came across that bridge, because I'd been down, Ashley and I had been down south, you know, filming. And when I came across that bridge and I saw the Mass of people that was at that way in, I teared up. I really did. I was like, "It's unbelievable. These these fans are fans of the sport." Yeah. yeah. I, and I think I look back and I'm like, and I've said this a bajillion times, but I think when everybody was involved in that, we were too close. I mean, it was very personal to all of us. Some of the best friends and. That yeah, I have ever had in my life, and you know, there, there was one that I'm not so sure wasn't my best friend, or, or isn't my best friend. Right. He's, he's right there. I've never had a brother, but certainly there's there's one or two that I would consider brothers, you know, so to speak. So it, that's why it was so hard. Yeah. That's why it was so hard. But it was never. It was never. A, a, I don't think it was ever personal. No, really personal to to me or you. It maybe maybe got personal for some people, but I don't think it really did. Well, for a little while it was personal, <laughs> I'll be honest. I mean, because yeah. you... Well, dude, I mean, you, you can't help but feel oh, you're leaving us, what we built. Like, you look at that whole crew, you you know, we all figured we're working at the same factory forever. I also think it's the best thing, in retrospect, that ever happened for the sport. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it, I don't know that it's been the best for some people. It, it's hurt uh, some people, but it has really helped some people. I mean, they. But so I, when I say it wasn't personal, I didn't hold any grudges towards the people that left because they thought they were doing the best thing for yeah, themselves and their family. I get that. Um, but yeah, it was personal because we're all competitive. It you know it was personal in a way because hey, we want to win. Put our heads down and work harder than you. And see what happens, but I, I mean, I didn't take, and I, I called, I called four people, not because I was working for Bass at the time, but because I 
I felt like I really needed to talk to them because I didn't think that format and that route really fit them. Yeah. And I talked to them for a long time, but I never told them what they should do. And I told them I would always respect the decision they made if they thought it, you know, it being the best for them and their family. And I still don't have no any problem with it. All four of those people have called me in the last year saying that it was not a good move. Yeah. Paul and Nick, and I don't think I've ever told this on the podcast, but we're telling stuff. <laughs> Paul and Nick explained it best, honestly, at the time, because, I mean, me and him, I mean, we all have special relationships with different people, That's and right. he, he's obviously somebody that's pretty special to me, and it was emotional. Like, we were all on the phone with people until 3 in the morning, and I remember Paul Nick said, he said, everything in my heart tells me to stay, but my mind can't let me override my heart and say, yeah. you're the only one that sees it right. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think that we, when I mean we took it to, we were too invested in it because if you, now in retrospect, you look back at it and you put it to any other league, that people are not, people at one time were Billy and Bobby Murray fans. They were Guido right. Hibden fans. Then they were Rick Clone fans forever, <laughs> and Kevin Van Dam, Davey Height, but the, ultimately they're Bassmaster fans. That's right. Like, That's right. and it's just like I obviously like the Chiefs, and I obviously like Patrick Mahomes. Right. We talked about this in the trailer today. Crawford's hearing a recycled story, but um, if Patrick Mahomes signed for a full billion and was going to play even in the USFL, I'm not happy. I'm right. a Chiefs fan. You know what I mean? That's I'm still a Chiefs fan. Right. I, I don't. So yeah, I think that's what we. You know what I mean? They they like the smell, the sound, the music, the voices of you know Tommy Sanders, yourself, yeah. Mark Zona. Here's a weird one. So you don't work for Bass, let's say. You don't retire. You're still competing. Would you stay? There again, I just mentioned, <laughs> it's, it's easy to say in hindsight, and, and I don't know if you truly, it's, it's just like, you know, people that go through things in their family and in yeah. their personal life, it's hard to put yourself in someone's shoes that you've really never walked in those shoes. But I'll give you the best answer I can, I'm not so sure. I, I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I would have, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I would have, you know, it, it'd be real easy right now to say the right thing. Yeah, and I I don't think I would have, but I wouldn't I wouldn't swear to that because there were there were a lot of very convincing uh, stories statements. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, well, uh, let's be honest. The reason you cried crossing the freaking bridge at the St. John's River is because for months all you heard is I had nobody's coming. Yep. These dudes aren't going to catch a bass. Yep. No fans will show up, yep. and nobody's watching. Yep. And, exactly right. And it was, like, I, dude, I remember that was an emotional week for everybody. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I remember day one, it's like, oh, there's a giant crowd here. And it, yeah. it had every reason for it not to not work. Not to be, yep. And it felt, honestly, it felt a lot like our rookies this week. They had that special where it's like, you're on the freaking Bassmaster <laughs> Elite yeah. Series. Like, yeah. this... People don't show up like this right. for any right. fishing tournament. Never mind bass yeah. fishing tournament. So I think even Ben Milliken uh, uh -huh. was, was kind of whoa. Yeah, this is this is a deal here. I mean, and he's you know he seemed to not get rattled about anything. He had a very you know confident presence about him, which is good. Yeah. But I think even he was like, wow, this this is the real deal. This yeah. is different. Yeah. yeah, it was very cool. It was. Um, it's weird. I I can't believe we haven't been here in seven years. Yeah. But didn't think like it. Didn't seem like it'd been that long, but it had been. I was still fishing way back then. Way back <laughs> then. How long did it take you to make that decision? Like, was it years or was it months? Was it weeks? To. To stop fishing the elites and, and yeah, work for bass? Well, you had to have, you had to kind of make the, 
bought before you even got the opportunity with bass? Or was it just simply the opportunities here? So I dreamed of being a Bassmaster Pro. It wasn't elites, you know. Yeah, I was yeah of, of course. It. For my whole life, for my whole life. But I never, never even thought uh, that I would be, you know, doing commentary, or, you know, doing what I'm doing now for bass. But I had been thinking for several years that I didn't want to fish into my 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure. And uh, I wouldn't take anything for the, the 24 years that I had being able to live my dream. Yeah. Not just chase my dream, but live my dream. And accomplish, I promise you, way more than I even dreamed of. I did. I mean, I dreamed of being able to make a Bassmaster Classic. And I remember making the first one. I was like, this is it, and thank you, God, for letting me do this one time. I'm not in contention to win. I'm not going to win. Roland Martin was boat the boat right in front of me. <laughs> I, I'm just here, and thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. I didn't even, you know, I had no idea, and, and I, it was just too big a dream. Like, I never dreamed of being Tom Brady, but I dreamed of being a pretty good high school quarterback. Yes. You know? So... When when it just kind of happened, I started doing the first tape, first loop thing, you know, yeah. and it just kind of, you know, all that just, and, and I had no idea. But then when I had the opportunity to work with you and so on and Tommy at the time, you know, it's like, gosh, how could you not love to do this and be involved in the sport? Yeah. I told you a bunch, and we talked about it a little bit earlier here today, that if I was sitting at home uh, and this tournament was going on and all the excitement and catching 100 pounds, I, I would miss the heck out of it. Yeah. But I feel like I'm a part of it. I'm a different part of it. Um, but I'm a part of it. And I I benefited from Bassmaster and the organization um, my whole life. But now I, feel, I really try to make decisions and do things and look at the big picture. I owe back to the sport. And I try to I try to just look at the big picture and what's best for the future of the sport. Because fishermen, including myself, man, when you're trying to trying to win and you're trying to support your family and you're a thousand miles away from home, you can't help but be biased in, in like every decision you make. It's an individual sport and if yeah. you don't look out for you, who is? But I try very, very hard not to be like that now. When you said you got there and you just were like, I mean, I made the classic. That was the goal. When in your career, do you remember like the moment where you were like, I'm good. Like not, not you're comfortable, but just like I can hang with everybody. I'm going to make more. You know what I mean? I want to start. So that's a great question. Because while I, you answer it, I'm going to turn on this light to I see remember, if we, yeah. we can get it. So I, re I remember distinctly remembering when when I won Angler of the Year that I thought I was there. Yeah. So Just so, make it better. But oh yeah, look one hundred percent. Keep talking. I'm when gonna I get held, an energy drink, you yeah, need one. I'm good, thank you. When I held the classic trophy over my head, is is when that really happened and you know not until I did that not until I did that I do remember winning my first Bassmaster event and I thought a week or two after that that it was going to I, I thought like wow the sponsors are going to knock my doors down now and they did yeah. they didn't at all when I won my first event it's like okay can you win another one can you win another one but when I held the classic trophy over my head very I can remember this just like it was yesterday. Number one, the first thing I thought that I never thought I would, I'd never thought of. When I held it up, I looked, and we were in the New uh, New Orleans Superdome. Cool place to win the yeah. classic. And for whatever reason, instead of thinking about me, I looked at everybody that was just like, you know, cheering so, so loud and so strong. I immediately thought I wish every every person I'm looking at, and I mean literally, like I'm standing there thinking, and this is crazy to be thinking of because you'd be, and I, you know, most people you would think would be thinking about, yeah, I just did it, I am the world champion. But I I looked, and for some reason I like focused on people and looked in their eyes, and I thought I wish 
I truly wish every single person that I'm looking at could experience yeah. what I'm feeling right now. And I don't know where that came from, but I, it was all of a sudden about them. I mean, it really was like, I wish he could be doing this. I wish he could do this. I wish she could, you know, I, I was just, I was, it's crazy. But do I you remember, remember that. their faces? Like, in your, like, absolutely. You were, absolutely. And I, I, that had never crossed my mind. It wasn't like, you know, when I was 12, I was dreaming of winning a classic and I was going to yeah. hope that somebody in the audience could win it. I don't know where it came from, but for some reason, all of a sudden, I just was looking in faces of people and thinking, I wish you could, I wish you could, I wish you could, I wish you could. Wow. Did you feel this and experience Yeah, this? yeah. It's weird because it's different. Like Christy said, he doesn't even remember like the confetti or anything. Like wow. Shannon, the next morning, Shannon's like, Dude, "How about all that confetti?" And he's like, "There was no confetti. Like, he didn't <laughs> even remember it." That's fun. <laughs> uh, I always just think it. I always wonder what, you know what I mean? Like that moment. I, I mean, the idiots like me would be like, "I hope my tummy's not hanging out of my shirt." Or, <laughs> <laughs> Do you, no, but is it like outer, like? What can you compare it to? Like what? What can you compare it to anything? No, no, I really can't. And and it's it's probably the only thing that I can't compare. You know, the only great thing that's happened in my life that I can't sort of compare to, like my first granddaughter being born, of course, or, you know, something yeah. like that. But it is you, you can't compare it to it because it's just so different. Um, I'm not saying one's better than. The other for me personally in my life and my course. time here on this earth, but other than my family, um, not even close. It's not even close. And I won, you know, I won the FLW Cup Championship. You know, it changed names a couple times through there. At the time, it was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. The first year it was that. It was the most money ever paid in a in a fishing tournament at that time ever. Every Walmart in America, it was on the TVs that were in the Walmarts. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> it was crazy. And that was a big deal back then. That was the closest thing to live fishing on TV we'd ever had, I think. Um, but then the next year, I won the Classic. And, and you know, nothing. It's, it's not even close. I'd, I'd already won an angry year at the time, and nothing is, is close to, to the Bass Monster Classic. You were a quarterback in high school, did you say? Yeah. I, is that even compared? No, but I mean, even I mean, I've been to high schools in the south. Oh, like winning quarterback on? Yeah, a, like oh it, my god, no. no, no, no. Huh? So when you watch someone else win, like when you watch every year, what, does it bring you back there, or do you like? How, it, and you have to see it through different eyes than somebody like me. It does, and it's interesting to see how different people react and see their emotions. Um, but. But I've I've got a little different deal. I've never heard anyone talk about this, and for some reason, this this is in Davy's mind. When I watch a classic, when I'm there live and I see the winner, the winner is all good. Yeah. I really pay attention to the second place mm. finisher, and and I try to talk to them at some point yeah. soon because I had a second place finish before I won, and I'm second place finish in the Bassmaster Classic. I think I feel like. 99% of the other people man I was that close and I'll never get that close again Yeah, and I, I missed it that far one fish I lost one fish I weighed in 14 I lost one pound and a half fish right by the boat and lost you know, finished second in the Bass Master Classic and I thought you blew it that was your only chance um, so I tried to talk because once I really thought about it and as time passed it was the greatest thing that happened to me in my career at the time to finish second in the class it was my greatest accomplishment at the time and you have to look at it like that instead of your biggest defeat how long does that take though like the it, next it morning long. you gotta be pissed no right? yeah I was I was I was no it took time how long were you probably six months wow and I still replay it in my mind like you have to because of the one fish I lost there's no reason I should have lost it it was it was a big crankbait had had one hook here and one there. I hit this close and was going to swing it and it made it went kind of made one little surge. I'm like let it let it do that and come up. I remember it just like it was yesterday. I don't think I did anything wrong. Uh, and and I saw both hooks 
it had it there and there, but obviously it wasn't meant to be. So when you go to your next classic after having that happen to you, after going through that, after... I would feel like in the morning of, I'm going to be, that's, I'm driving there and I'm thinking about that and I'm like, or can you totally, like as the smart competitor, were you able to like exercise it and be like, focus on today? So there's a couple things. Probably the dumbest thing I've ever done towards my children is I promised my five-year-old son Yeah. 30 seconds after I lost that classic that I would win a classic. You, know, you make promises to your children, that's, that's risky business. I should have never done that, but I did. And then a little later when when I realized it's not a bad thing, it's a great thing, because you're that close to being a world champion. Um, but I was focused like no tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so I finished second, and I don't, you know, this is just this is just things that happen, and like I say, the reason I think ninety percent of it happened is because I made a promise I should have never made to my son. So I finished second in the ninety six classic. I was angry year in ninety seven. I won the cup in ninety eight. I won the classic in ninety nine. So I, I kind of went on a tear. Tear, yeah. And and every day, every day after I finished second in the classic, and I promised my son, I was obsessed with I'm going to win a classic. That's easier said than done. There's a lot of people that have told themselves they are going to win a classic. Um, but but I had made a promise that I should have never made and I was hell bent to So what do you mean show my son upset like I know wanting it, but like to compete I was, at that I was, level, like every day you thought about Oh yeah, absolutely. 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 Like the the next classic I I knew what I was going to do in the classic because we had a pre fish time ahead of time. So like the next classic, I went fishing for for two weeks, like fourteen days, for not not an hour or two, but like ten, twelve hour days doing what I knew I was going to do in the classic on a different lake to be the best I could be. And if you do something every day for fourteen days in a row, you're going to be pretty good at it. Uh, you know, whether it's skipping dogs or throwing crap. So I was. And I'm not making excuses for not staying on that run for, for another three, five, ten years. But once I did that, I didn't, I didn't, you know, put the brakes on. But I was just obsessed. And my children were old, old enough at the time that I just started kind of really liking being the dentist. Yeah. And that happens. You see that in our sport so much. You see uh-huh. that in our sport so much with, with some people. When you're, yeah, it's just like Kiyoi. I mean, his life is the Bassmaster Elite Series. Yeah. He's young. He's, you know, he's got stuff going on. Um, and I, we've talked about other anglers that it's incredible that they can keep it. Brandon Paul is one. Yeah. He's got a lot going on but can keep his A game up. And that's 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 hard. That's really, really hard. I don't regret, you know, I don't say tapping the brakes, but, yeah, that's probably the best way to describe it because it was – family that I wanted to be with yeah. and spend more time with. But but there was a time period there from like 96 to 2000, 2001 or two or whatever that that I was a different angler. I, I really was. What does that feel like? Like, the, is it pressure to keep it going or is it more like, this will never end. I'm on fire. So, I think a lot of Guys, when they get on a good roll like that, maybe thinks, you know, hey, this is never going to end. But I, I kind of knew that, that it was. Yeah. I've thought this little saying for a long time that you're, you're not as good as you ever think you are, but and you're not as bad as you think you are at times. You're kind of somewhere in the middle. Um. So, you know, just back to me making the first classic, I was, I was so happy that I was in – had qualified for a Bassmaster Classic. Because I didn't know, personally know anyone that ever had. So it was just being there was a big, big deal to me. I had no idea I'd fish you know, 14 or 15, whatever, something like that. How old were you when you said, I, I got to do this? I mean, not not when you did it. I mean, because I know, obviously, you were in the military. So, but like, at yeah. what age was it like? 
The year before I did, so I was twenty six oh, really? or twenty seven. Yeah, I dreamed of it, but I thought it was a you know a far fetched dream. I really did. Wow. But like the year before I did it, um, I was like, I've got to do this. I've got because I can't get it on my mind, off my mind, and it, it was also holding me back in my military career um, because I was not as focused there as I need to be. Yeah. So. The reason I say a year earlier, because I had to start saving money. And I saved every dime, every way, did extra work. I mean, I'd cut a load of wood and go sell it on a Saturday if I didn't have anything else to do, make 50 bucks back then. You know, just everything I could do to put some money, and I put it over to the side. Yeah. So it took me, actually, a little over a year to have enough money to last a year. And, and I had a one-year-old son, we were had just bought a different piece of property, going to build a, a little bit bigger house on Lake Murray. So it's tough. It's yeah. a very, very tough decision, but I had to do it. And and the thoughts of not trying pushed me to try. the The fear of failing or not being successful was my new. The thought of if I'm 50, 60, 70 years old, sitting on a porch <laughs> with Dave Mercer or anyone like Dave Mercer and not trying, I, I won't be able to handle that. I won't be able to live with that. Failure did not scare me nearly as much as the thought of not trying. Yeah. So that's what I did. In fact, when I when I left my job with the military and left, you know, got out, and I, I, was, I told everybody, I'll probably be back here in a year, you know, begging you know, to, to get a position back and be here. I didn't leave saying, okay, I'm about to go, you know, win a Bassmaster Classic. Not at all. But I was like, I've got to go do this. And my wife, you know, Natalie, she she knew me well enough to know that I had to try that. Or she probably wouldn't be able to live with me, you know, for a lot of years. I think that what you said is the most, like... It's everybody. Like, people are like, I dream of being a pro angler, and that's an easy... But it's almost, it has to be a nightmare for you yeah. to... Like, everybody, you know, Paul Nick says that, everybody says... I mean, even the route that I took, which is a much different route, but I never, ever thought, there's no way. Like, I'm like, there's, of course I'm going to do this. This right. is what I... I'm not going to stop until I can't. Right. And... Yeah. Do you think it's, it's, was it easier then or harder or easier now? It's a great question. Everybody's got their opinion on a lot of things, but I think in all sports, including ours, if you're competing at the top level, if you're successful there, it's, it's always just as tough. Are the fishermen better now than they were 20 years ago? Absolutely. But a lot of that is the the tools that they have yeah. at their disposal. But you know that debate about you know is such you know is is Roland Martin or is Rick Clun or is you know Danny Brower or Larry Nixon or you know you could go on and on. Are they as good as these guys now? They were the best of the best at their time. So that's all you can be. Yeah, is better than the best. Now, if you you know, I was in Federation clubs. If I'm the best in the club, do you compare compare me with Denny Brower? No. But if you're competing against the best yeah. that, that are invited to come from all over the world and and you're at that top level, then you know, I, I don't see how you can think that somebody in twenty twenty four is any better than somebody in nineteen eighty four if they're the best of the best. Yeah. That's just yeah, the Michael Jordan, LeBron it's James, a thing, argument, you get though, too. Patrick Mahomes, Bart Starr. Yeah, you know, really. You look at Bart Starr. <laughs> uh, he probably not as good as Patrick Mahomes, <laughs> but he was the best of the best. Yeah, and that's all you can be. But it's a stupid argument because you're always going to back your generation. You know what I mean? I'm always yeah. going to say yeah. Michael Jordan was the best. Right. My son's probably and he, no, he doesn't say that yet. He's still a Jordan. He's smart. But a lot of kids his age would say it's LeBron, you know, or in totally. 10 years from now, 15 years from now, it's going to be somebody. And it's the same in fishing. Like, yeah. you're only the, 
Yeah. You just don't know how good Denny could really flip that. Yeah. Game. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I agree with that. But I also think that all you can do is be the best of the best at your time. Who was truly better? Are, are these fishermen now better than, than the ones in 1984? Sure. But, gosh, so look at the boats. Look at, you know, the cast, that series at Bass. Yeah. Look at that stuff. How primitive all that is. The educational roots. Was it harder to be like good the, when you had no, you, you really had no, you know, ability to really learn and get educated about things? You had to go out and do you know, Yeah. So, I don't know. It's a good, good question, though. I want you to give me... And I know you're going to be bashful to tell this story. But did you have a legendary... I mean, everybody knows you won the Bassmaster Classic on Bacon Ride. <laughs> but... It wasn't physically bacon, right? Even though we did use pork charts back then. It was a <laughs> soft plastic bacon. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what was its actual name? Bacon. Yeah, it was the, the bacon. Bacon Ride. The bacon Ride. Was... Basil Bacon. Uh-huh. Uh, does it help design the bank? But you never tell anyone this. And you, dude, you called. And I think it's one of the most awesome things. I don't, I don't think it makes you sound boastful or anything. I just think it explains that time. Like when you said, when I had my run, it explains how your head is and how connected you are. Tell me what happened. So... I've not told many people this story because it does sound very arrogant. No. But I wasn't, and I didn't call. Mike Sermon owned Gambler Lures at the time, they, and they were sponsor of mine. And Mike knew I wasn't that way. But I pre fished, you know, we had our pre fishing time back then, just like they do now. Um, I say just like similar. Um, and my. My life was revolved at that time about around winning a Bassmaster Classic. Yeah. So I had a good pre fish, and a, a real good pre fish. The first thing, in my opinion, you have to do to win a tournament is find the winning area. Yeah. And then the next thing is dissect it. And with multiple day tournaments, three day, four days, you've got to, to really, like I said, dissect it. So I found an area that I knew looking at weights in that area, what it take and what I called in practice that I could win. And I fish baits, different baits to try to see which was the best bait. And I, I, if I had to throw a helicopter lure to win the Bassmaster Classic, I was not too proud to throw you know, anything. Yeah. A pink rooster tail I would throw to win the Bassmaster <laughs> Classic. I don't know why you wouldn't. You use the best bait. Yeah. And I catch a lot of flack about, oh, you just used that banker rhyme because it was, that's totally not true. Not because it was a sponsor, a plastic sponsor of mine. I tried everything I could try. And I, I, I really tried hard to, to get them to bite a jig better. I really did because I was a jig guy 100% at that point. But for some reason, with the wings trimmed off of the bacon rind, <laughs> it was the best bait. So I called Mike Sermon. But, and and when, when is this? How far ahead of the like? A uh, couple weeks before the before the classic. Yeah, when it, we had a official practice period, and then you know it was a couple weeks at that point. Um, so I called Mike Sermon, and I said, "Hey," and I trust and I think the world of Mike Sermon to this day, and, and I did then. And I said, "Hey, I think I got a real good shot to win this Bassmaster Classic on one of your baits." And he's like. <laughs> Oh, really? I said, yeah, the, the bacon run. I said, but, and I knew at the time that basil bacon was getting a royalty on that bait. I said, you know, if I win the classic on that bait, it, is it just going to make basil bacon a lot of money or will we work something out? And he said, you go win the classic and I promise you we'll work something out. Nothing in writing. I didn't need anything in writing, in writing from Mike Sermon. I knew his word was gold. And uh, it turns out, it turns out that I did, and and I won it on the bacon run. Um, and I've heard so many stories that are not true about that. I mean, I, I even had someone that's got a podcast that told me um, you didn't even catch him on the bacon run. You, I'm like, 
what? I know we didn't have live TV back then, but are you serious? You're, you're you know, and that's insulting to, to yeah. look me in the face and tell me I didn't catch fish on a bait that I know I caught them on the Winter Bass Master Classic. But, but anyway, it is what it is. There's a lot of there's a lot of rumor about baits back in the day before we had, and I don't hold that against the yeah. person that's saying that. But they just heard a lot of you know misinformation. Um, but yeah, I wanted on a bacon. Thirteen and fifteen, I weighed in. I I caught on a bacon rat. And you freaking pointed out. <laughs> Well, I got real lucky, but but credit dude, to, that has to. I mean, dude. So it changed Gambler Lures. They went from a you know a small company to a much bigger company because I they had a Florida screw lock weight. Yeah, and, and the Florida bacon rack. rack, and I used both to win the classic. And and there again, I got to give credit where credit's due. Mike Sermon looked looked after me, and it you know paid me a you know. Fair amount of, a lot of money, I guess. <laughs> 30 years off of a royalty. Does Basil Bacon really like you? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So do you remember Basil? Um, he, he wore, like, coffee uh, time polyester slacks. <laughs> so, like, I noticed right after I won a class that he had a different color every day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the world of Basil. Yeah, when you think flipping, we were talking about a flip stick earlier, you have to think of him. But, yeah, I, it was a good day for him, too. It was a good day. I, I don't think that story's... And I get it. You worry that, but it, I just think it's legendary. You know what I mean? Like, it, dude. I mean, you know how many people have probably tried to pull that off? Well, I mean, yeah. So you and I have been around fishermen <laughs> our whole lives. There's a lot of people that call their shots, but not not often do they they actually come true. And I'm not saying I'm, you know, I just. I wasn't hundred percent I was going to, but I knew I'd found the right area and I knew I'd found the right bait. And I knew no one else in Louisiana was throwing a bacon round at the time. It uh I think it's it's just incredible to, and it's also I mean, you hear stories about people that get screwed over by it. You know, a handshake deal. Like they, they I mean, they didn't have to do anything yeah. if they wanted to More times than not. Yeah. That's why I say Mike Sermon is and everybody that knows Mike and has known him for any length of time, him and his wife Cindy are their their goal. They're you know, as good people and because I'm telling you it's a lot of money through the years that he he Yeah he could have said, Well, I didn't quite understand what you were saying. <laughs> here's here's a couple thousand dollars, thank you for, for using it. He did not do that. He was a man of his word. How many baits did you try before the bacon ride? <laughs> 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 I probably, but see, that's the thing, because so many people are just <laughs> like you. They think, he ought to use a bacon rind because uh, he knew he would make money from royalties. It was not that. It was not that. I probably tried at least three or four. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I don't, I, I think I know you too well to know, I don't think you could do that. No, you know what so I mean? Like, a, I don't think, even yeah. if somebody, if you were... It's a big misconception about the sport. Or if it's not, then I think you, you if you're an elite fisherman, not even in a classic, but if you're an elite angler and you're throwing baits only because you have a sponsor, then there's a problem there. Yeah. You need to help that company design a different bait. If you think one's better or you, you know of, of you know, you, you're gonna make one better. Yeah. Because it's it's way bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. And and I try to surround myself with sponsors through the years. That that have product that you believe in, because it's 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 a you know it's a can of worms if you don't you have to believe in it. Yeah. But then, no one company makes everything perfectly. No. No one company. So if I have to use something else, I'll use it, and then maybe help that company develop something similar or better or you know that sort of thing. But. For me to just throw a bacon rind in 99 Classic because I might make some royalty on it would be very stupid for me to do. I think that whole story just helps describe your headspace at that time. Like, I think it, one of, I mean, I watched Kevin do it. It, yeah. it one of the, it's like you're a fire-breathing dragon. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. like it. Ten foot tall and bulletproof. Yeah. On a mission that nobody's going to stop me. Yeah, 100%. Well, well, when did you first meet Kevin? I never asked you this. When I 
you know, I read about him before. See, he he's a little younger, than yeah, me, a couple of years, but he started fishing Bassmaster before I did. Um, so I knew of him. I read Bassmaster magazine, and and I heard he was a little, you know, arrogant northern guy that, you know, was a pretty good. And back to Tommy Martin a little bit. Tommy Martin and some of the guys, old school, um, southern guys that were like, oh, he's the real deal. He's the real deal. Um, so I'd heard of him. And obviously, he, he started having success immediately. Um, the first time I really, I guess, got to know him a little bit is when I finished second to him at, at the St. Lawrence River, my second year. Um, talked to him a little bit when I won Ufala, um before that. the year My first full year, I guess, I won that Ufala event. Um, so I gradually got to know him. Um, and you know, the only, we've got so much in common, you know, our accents are obviously very different, but yeah. we, we have so much in common. It's not even funny. It's yeah. Even funny. Why, why was he as good as he, he had that, he, or he has that. Has, yeah. No, that, he's still around. That same, <laughs> sorry, get you know, head space <laughs> or whatever, yeah, um, that I had for a, a few years. And that's one of the things that's so incredible. You know, I thank the Lord for me having a few good years. And and some other people have had that also. But for him to maintain that for as long as he did is so absolutely incredible. Because he has boys growing up. He's, you know, loves his family. Spends time with his family when he's in between terms. Business, you know, obviously a lot of sponsor stuff, commitments. He works his tail off doing shows and seminars that, you know, it's he's just so many things going, and that that distracts and takes away from nine out of ten anglers, including me. It did. Yeah, it did. And, and after I won the after I won the classic, I made a commitment to do every show and every seminar I could. Yeah, I was getting paid for a lot of them, but but then there was also a number of them that I was just doing for sponsors, you know, day sponsor days. But I thought, hey, you're probably not going to win a classic every now every couple of years. You really need to pay back your sponsors now yeah. that you've done that because you, you're in because you're in high demand. Kevin did all that, and he'd be right back fishing at the same level next year, which is it's so difficult if you've never been there, and that is. I mean, you can look from the outside and say, "Yeah, that's great," yeah. but but honestly, if you've never been like do a do a show in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, one night, do one in Slidell, Louisiana, the next night, and then fly back to South Carolina that night and leave that morning to go to the tournament. Wow. If you've never done that day after day after day, it's hard to really understand. And Kevin's done that even more than me for all those years and been successful. It's, it's really, really, really amazing. If you, I mean, you just look, and I studied the history of the sport and how anglers had done and the money they had won and, and the longevity of careers. I did all that stuff before I ever quit my job to, to be a pro angler. Yeah. And look for what set, he's done. Set, look, at me, look at that professional angler. There we go. Look, look at this. That's awesome. Wow. That's awesome. Who needs their own trailer? <laughs> <laughs> I like this setting. I feel right at home. Oh, it does. It does. Um, I think one of the most amazing things about him, too, dude, is he won from, the, like, I mean, he, I mean, we talked about Curie's start. His was incredible. And he never struggled for, like, the first 25 years of his career. Right. And then when he hit that four or five year skid, when everybody's like, he'll never win again, I think him. Yeah. Being able to come back and being able to, because you, if you've never, like if you start and you start normally and you struggle for a while and you dig yourself out of it, you're used to, you're talking about a guy who never, ever struggled. Yeah. Like he never had, like it's like the guy that goes into the bar and never, ever doesn't get the number. Right. And then one day, <laughs> they just stop. Yeah. I mean, a bad analogy, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's stupid. So I said for a lot of years that uh, 
somebody would be going through a hard time, including myself. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say to other people to try to, you know, motivate them, perk them up a little bit. There's no fisherman in this sport that hasn't struggled and gone through rough times, except Kevin Van Dam, is what I would say yeah. for a number of years. But then he eventually did, much later than any other angler <laughs> that I know of. But just for a little bit, for yeah. him, and it's all relative. You know, a struggle for him is not winning in a couple of years. You got guys that are great anglers and haven't won in 20 years. Yeah. So everyone that's ever fished this sport, fished at this level in the sport, has struggled at some point. Everyone. Every once in a while, Lee, uh, is it just Lee Livesey that's cooking up this rumor? But every once in a while, Davy's coming back. <laughs> Do you think you'd ever, is there any combination of events or? So you never know what might happen. Yeah. Right? As long as I have the job I have now and get to work with people like you. Zona and Tommy Rancy, and Mike, yeah, uh, and, and the other Mike and <laughs> Michael, and uh, then no, I'll be that blunt. But you know, we had something five years ago that happened that we never dreamed was going to happen. Yeah. Things changed; the world kind of went upside down in our sport. Um, so I'm not going to say I would, and, and I'm not saying it's not possible. I feel like, and I could be totally wrong. I still feel like I could compete. Uh, and, yeah. and the first few people I told about not fishing the elites anymore and, and working with bass, first thing out of their mouths. The, the people I trusted most at the time, to, and I felt like I needed to give them a heads up about what I was about to do. Oh, I think you've got some more in you. Yeah, and I did too. But I was, I was, I was happy with the decision I made. I wouldn't take anything for the 24 years. I dreamed about it my whole life. I wouldn't take anything for it and I thank the Lord every day for giving me that opportunity. But I enjoy what I'm doing now. Yeah. I really do. It's, uh, I, I find it even more rewarding since the split. And it's weird because at one point I was like, how the hell am I not going to work with all of these guys? Right. But it's like, it's cool to see, to feel like you're helping build something. Yeah. You know, all the, I mean, all those rookies, I tried to go to my way to make sure I welcomed them all. And I tried to, but it's, you, you see little things happen, you know what I mean? Even day three way in, there was several different moments that happened on the stage. Maddie Wong did some funny stuff. I mean, there was a lot of, Carl Jacobson's daughter was really funny up there. Um, Hank Cherry made a lot of people react up there. But <laughs> I, to me, that that's what I get. Ex- you know what I mean? Like I'm like, hey, these people are starting to. We got to entertain people, but I feel like I I don't think I thought that before I had the job, and I, I, like I think all of us kind of feel like that. Yeah. You get your. Yeah. What's the favorite part of it, the job for you? Like. So I, I, and you know, some people may not even believe this, but I, I feel like I owe the sport because it gave a lot to me. And my favorite part of the job is I think I have a chance to make a different, a positive impact on the sport, and I, and I don't want to fail at that. Yeah. And you know, whether we're talking about the future of Ford facing or. or you know, whatever. Because I, I, can, I think I can relate to the anglers better than a lot of people because I was an angler Obviously. for 24 years and I've been on this side of the table, so to speak, for six. Um, and and I don't think I have to make you know, biased decisions like I know I probably did for 24 years because I was concerned about making a living and providing for my family. Now I'm truly concerned about giving back and hopefully making a positive impact at, at tournaments. Talking to the anglers and stuff. Like yeah. going and talking to the second place finisher in the Bass Master Classic. I think I, I think I'm supposed to do that because I finished second and I know exactly how they feel and it's not a good feeling. No. And turn it into a positive thing. And if there's anything I can do to to enjoy working with you and you know, all the folks 
at Bass, and then also contribute back somehow, then then that's incredible. I don't I don't know what else I could do as far as employment to to be any better than that and be any more re rewarding, you know. But you know, I can do a lot of things now at this point in my life to with my three granddaughters and that sort of thing. Yeah. That, that is super, super important to me. When you walked in a few minutes ago, I was FaceTiming with, with one of them. It's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Here's a weird thing that bothers me. Trey and Chris have a great podcast. I mean, obviously, Bill's. But one of the questions they ask, and this isn't even close to any of their controversial stuff, because okay. they, they do like to ride. I thought you were about they to go do, there. Well, no, I would have got you another energy drink. But. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it bugs me. They ask all these pros, why, or if you, would you advise your children to get into this? And in unison, I think everyone they've asked says no. Says no. Yeah. And I'm just like, and I get it. I know what, the, I'm a dad. I know what they're saying. You just want your kid to be safe and happy. But I'm also like, I freaking love my life. Yeah. I know you love your life. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, isn't that disturbing? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I get... The, oh, you shot Gosh, it I'm sorry. <laughs> I am sorry. It was so professional right after that <laughs> plug. <laughs> but, and I get the... That's one of those questions almost set up. Yeah. And people want to say, no, no, it's tough. It's, But it is tough. But, I mean, it's also freaking awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to try to make a long story short. Um... I wanted, like most dads, I wanted my two sons to be better than me, be greater than me, have better opportunity than me. And that doesn't mean give them a lot of money. You know, it, it's, I want them to be better human beings than me. Yeah. Have, be uh, well educated and, and you know, re have respect for other people and, and certainly their family and, and people older than them. Yes, sir. No, ma'am. Kind of stuff. And, and that's a Southern thing. Oh, but, yeah. But the, the fact that I wanted my, my two boys to be greater than me was first and foremost. So I never told them to be or not to be a professional actor. I always tried to emphasize to them to get a good education was, was not really an option. That they were going to, by God, or I'm gonna rub your nose in the dirt. <laughs> and that's you can ask them both. It was kind of almost that way. But I would also say to them, it doesn't matter to me if you want to cut lawns for a living, but you're going to have an education, and and it's my job to be your dad and not your friend until you're you're out of school. And, and I think they respect that now, but I'm sure there were a lot of times they were saying things under their breath that, that wasn't so good. I never suggested that they should be or should not be a professional angler. I've thought about it a lot since they're really? grown now. And, and part of me thinks that maybe I should have because I'm, I'm like you, I love my life. And my oldest son in particular loves to bass fish and loves the term of bass fish. But they're both doing great things, and they're both doing things that we hope that they would do. But they have they're in different places doing you know, one's a army ranger company commander, and the other is a high school or assistant principal. Great things, and I look back like, gosh, I should have because I see the other, I see Alton Jones Jr. I see yeah. and you can name them. You see kids that. that Gosh, they were the same. They were in a pool when they were four years old together with those same kids. It would be cool to have one of my sons doing that. But I don't regret any of that. But here's the thing that I think of most. They were around it so much and they saw daddy's got to go, daddy's got to go, daddy's got to go. Pressure, you know, the, the part that's not holding the plastic trophy over your hand, all that other. And I, th I don't think they ever ever even thought seriously about wanting to be a professional like because they saw the other side yeah. and saw too much of it. They were around the other part way, way too much. What, which I get that, but I just don't, I find it frustrating that a bunch of people who chased a dream 
self admittedly not just a dream, something they felt they couldn't yeah. live without. And then it's like, yeah, but I, I know. I've heard other anglers say that. Some some close friends of ours. And I would never say that. I, I, I don't. Because I never told them what they should or should not do as far as a career yeah. the rest of their life. And I certainly wouldn't tell them not to be a professional angler because, oh, my, you know, I've made way more money doing what I do or have done than I did if I'd stayed in the uh-huh. military. So it's been good to me. For, for that reason, but that's that's a small part of it. The other part is, it's what I dream to do and I enjoy yeah. doing. Hard work is not hard work when you really enjoy doing it. So I would never tell my sons, oh, don't you go be a professional angler because you're doomed if you do. Yeah. Because it's, it's not the case. But that being said, I never told them not to do anything that they wanted to do. Yeah. As far as a career. And I, I distinctly, for whatever reason, I said, if you want to mow grass for a living, you can do that. But you're going to be an educated grass mower. And the best at it. Yeah. <laughs> or, or I hope that they would be and work hard at it. Yeah. But but education is something no one can ever take away from you. And and you can you might use it now, you might use it later. But it's something that, that will always be you know, beneficial to you. Yeah. And, and, you know, here I am. I'm a proud dad. If I brag about anything, it's going to be my family. And, you know, my oldest son is finished in the top two and a half, three percent at West Point with a physics wow. degree. My youngest son was high school valedictorian, top of his class in college, just got his master's with a straight 4-0 and going to get his doctorate. They take after their mom a lot. <laughs> but I told him they had to take after their mom. It's amazing what they're doing. Here's the thing. I don't even know if you want to talk about that. How do you... I didn't even want to bring it up because I think it's... Oh boy. No, it's it's about your sons. I mean, both your sons, but I just your son serving the country like that just blows me away. Um, How you? I super, mean, that's gotta proud. be so so yeah. proud, but so it is because I was there. Hard. And that. I'm I'm e- equally as proud of both of my sons. Yeah, I, I mean, I can truly say it. I'm not saying that because they might listen to this podcast. I probably truly won't. am. <laughs> not that <laughs> but but I truly am. But there's. Just for whatever reason, you know, I was in the military and, you know, I jogged along in basic training, singing, I want to be an airborne ranger. And I never was. No, nowhere close. And I have a son that's a company commander, uh, airborne ranger. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's cool. It's cool. So, like you said, you want them to be better than me. Better and they than have. And I've yeah. told them both that. Yeah, I, I didn't tell them that when they were sixteen or fourteen, but I've told them that both that now that they're grown men, you know, and they both played football. My oldest son was an offensive MVP in high school, played college ball. My youngest son was defensive MVP in high school, played college ball. I've told them both uh, after later in life that you're both better than me in football, you know, a lot of things. Uh, but when they were teenagers, I didn't tell them that. Uh, they needed to, to fear Davies a little bit. It was yeah. my job. It was my job. I think the world could use a little more fear nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> no, it's. Uh, I don't know. I'm weird with my kids because I look at my parents. My, you know, I'm the child of an immigrant. So, you know, me, my parents left Ireland for no reason other than us to have a better opportunity yeah. in life, and I. So I'm always like with my kids. I'm like, just do what you love. Like, I mean, you're yeah. gonna have to work your ass off at it. Same way I was. But I, was do, I didn't say don't be an angler or be no. an angler. I just do what you love. But you're gonna be educated. Yeah. And and I try to instill the, the hard work factor. And and it, it worked whether it because of me or their mom or whatever it worked. But they're both very hard workers. I I I don't think it matters what you do if you. It really doesn't matter as long as you you're willing to outwork people and you're decent to work with. I mean, at the end of the day, like there's the super talented assholes. <laughs> then as soon as their talent slips, people are like, "Yeah, you don't have a job right. anymore." Right. But if you're decent to work with right. and you're and you bust your ass, people will. Life works out pretty good. Yeah, life works out pretty good. Yeah. You want to have dinner? I want to have dinner. Yeah. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's a Sunday afternoon. Forgive us for having an energy drinks, I guess, but it's Sunday afternoon after the first Elite Series. I'm ready to go to dinner. Kenta Kamira. Did you hear that? Seven Red Bulls one day. Two packs of cigarettes, seven Red Bulls. That rivals Mark's own. <laughs> Not Red Bulls, but five-hour energies. Yes. My yes. heart would explode if I did that. He does it every day. It, last year, I told... I did it on purpose, but it was like the day after Welcher won Angler of the Year. And he's on one side of the dock. And me and Kent have had that joke for a year and a half. To, see, ever since I found out, because I'm always like... I think this was the first time I talked about it on the stage, but I said, how many Red Bulls? And it's always like six or seven. How many smokes? Two packs. <laughs> and, uh, and so... Kyle Welcher's sitting there and he's tying his stuff off and I asked Kent to on purpose in front of him because I knew that Kyle would be like, what? I mean, and I watched Kyle and he's like, this doesn't compute. I mean, he doesn't even eat bread so his brain works right. faster and Kent is powered by <laughs> seven Red Bulls. It's incredible. So I, I want to go to Denver. i got to tell you a quick story okay. about the energy. Because if I, if I drank three Red Bulls, I would be uh -huh. like this. Most people would, I think. Um, but... For some reason, it came to mind early on in my career, like, and this might have been right before I started fishing BASS, there was an angler that was, like, legendary around Alabama, Logan Martin area, um, that general area. I won't say a name, um, but I had great respect for him, and I finally got, he asked me to go fishing with him. Um, I guess this was right about the time I started fishing BASS, and... We had mutual friends, and I mean, he would win tournament after tournament. He's 80 years old and still fish all day long, just right in the middle of the heat, you know, in summertime in Alabama. And he fished a jig. He fished a jig shallow. He fished a jig offshore. He fished a jig. He fished a jig. And he fished a jig. Uh, a living rubber jig, but a smaller profile than a mop jig. So I was, you know, honored to be in his boat sitting in the back of the boat. I was in my 20s, he's 80 years old, and I'm just watching everything I can watch, learning everything I can learn. And he'd cast out and fish a jig, and he would he would shake his rod, shake his rod like nobody had ever seen. And I'm like, yeah, that just jumps out at me. He's fishing that jig different than anybody I've ever seen fish a jig. So I'm back there, I start, and he catches a fish or two, and I'm back there, you know, this is the deal. I figured it out, it didn't take long to figure this out. And he caught a fish or two or three. I've got it figured out. It's, it's a whole different way that he's fishing his, this jig offshore. And he broke off. He got hung and broke off. And he reached in his tackle box and he got another jig. And he got his line. And he went. <laughs> he couldn't hit the <laughs> He had a shake so bad. <laughs> he went like that so he just had those natural shakes so i don't know if he figured it out or just you know it was father time on him but i felt so dumb for about they're doing like this because he naturally had that going on anyway. that can happen that can happen i have a similar story <laughs> not fishing but so i first started to bass and you know trip generally hired the mcs before you know it's a bass master position mm -hmm. but don jim and jerry oh and jerry was kind of behind that stuff and he wanted me to be the new mc and thank god for him and um so i kind of got thrown on trip <laughs> to be honest <laughs> right. and um and not that we didn't get along but like it took a little while it, di it did it did and now I mean, I love him. I mean, he's honestly one of my... I hope when we're in Alabama, we can have him on live. Like, I love Trip and Mary. And, right. and it, it was hard to even think of him leaving. But what, So when I first started, the one thing that I luckily stumbled upon was I really sped up the weigh-ins when I first started. And everybody was like, we've got an hour off these weigh-ins. Which everybody... You know. You know, nobody wants a long way in right. until they're on stage, and then they don't care right. how long it is. Yeah. So I've earned this time. I've yeah. my time. Yeah. And they have, you yeah. know. So I'm on stage, and, and I'm kind of getting off on the fact that people are like, these are, you know, you, any new employee wants to get people happy. And I'm so every time I'm trying to speed up, and and I'm cooking through this way, and I look over in trips like this. He just keeps going like this with his hand. And like he's like, off, up, he's off the side and I just see his hands rolling. 
like, and I'm like, I guess he wants me to speed up. I mean, the international sign for speed up is sure. the rolling hand and the stretch is sure. the stretch. But no matter how fast I go, like, I'm firing through people. I'm not even saying their full name. I'm like, just height. <laughs> you're you're <laughs> right. right. And guys are trying to say something. I'm just, and all I keep seeing is Tripp's hand spinning like that. And I'm like, this son of a, like, <laughs> how fast can I go? Right. I mean, at some point, people have to, like, Right. But he just keeps doing it. And this went on for like a year. And it wouldn't always really? happen, but I would literally, and I'd just be like, gosh, i got to keep going faster and faster. And then one morning, me and him are just standing on the dock talking, and I look down, and he's spinning his hand. <laughs> and I'm like, why do you do that? And he's like, oh, I have really bad arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> so for a year, I think he is... Pissed at me. <laughs> this guy just wants me to non-stop speed up. And it was really just his rest of his story. Very sore. similar to my story. Very similar. That's great. That's great. No, it's uh, it's it's a wild time in our sport. It, but I, I think things are going to change. Like, I, I think there's going to be changes in the future. I, I don't, I'm not saying anything's going to go away or anything, but I... I Something's going to change, whether it be through the companies, whether it be through nature, whether it... Do, do you believe that? I do. I yeah. Do. Because, you know, there's, there's change, and it'll, you know, every action deserves an equal and opposite reaction. It's, uh, we'll see. I don't know the answer. No. I mean, you and I both know what we're talking about, and everybody listening does, too. I, I certainly don't know the answer. Um, but... Change is good. Change is good. Yeah, and as long as it's made through educated points, and, and I'm there's some positivity. That's all I'm. And and I feel like this past week, as weird as this event was, but there's a strong future. I think for, oh, yeah. for all of this, and, and in some ways, I also think there's what I hate is the us against them. Like I hate the fact that they're anglers. Hating anglers. You took you took the words out of my mouth. Because going back to I truly, I mean I've got a dog in the fight, like in a big way, but really I don't, because I I'm not an angler, and yeah. you know if the world wouldn't come to an end if I wasn't working with bass next week. I truly, it matters to me to try to do the best thing for the future of the sport, yeah. and. When I talk to some people, that some anglers, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, some anglers are so passionate about their opinion or their thoughts, and, and they think they're so right. And I get that. I yeah. get that. I, I don't have any problem with that. But it all of a sudden becomes, if, if, if people don't agree with that, then they, then you're the enemy, just yeah. like you said. And I'm not the enemy. You're not the enemy. Um I, I get the passion. I get the folk because, you know, like I said, I've been there. I've, I've, it's it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And that's why, you know, fishing for 24 years professionally, I'm fine with it. Yeah. I didn't want to do it for 50 years. To each his own. More power to Rick Clunn for doing it for 50 years. But I I didn't want to because the pressure is real. Yeah. It is, it is real. And I understand guys are so passionate because there's a lot of pressure there. Um, but I don't want to be thought of as the enemy. I, I'm, I don't know the answer. I'm not saying that I'm going to, going to know the answer or if there is. But I will listen to everyone's opinion and, and an idea that and, and would would agree with. If I think if somebody tells me the magic answer and it's, I think it's going to solve everything, I'll be all over it and give them 110% credit for it. Man. We, we talked, and we do have to go to dinner because my energy drink is empty. <laughs> and uh, we talked about it the other day at lunch. Here's a funny thing that floats around. Has Bass said to you what you should say about forward face? No, Arizona? no. Everybody okay. thinks we are preaching from a pulpit. Like, I, I'm glad that you brought that up. I'm really glad. They absolutely have not. You know, I worked for the military before I was a professional angler, and then I had to make all the decisions myself there. But now working for Bass, it's amazing how many things, even Mike McKinnis, you know, he's he's my boss, you know, and 
first line supervisor, as we would say in the military, so many days I'm like, tell me what you want me to do. I just <laughs> let you do. But as far as your your opinion when you're talking to anglers needs to be this, or your answer needs to be that, that is not the case. I don't know if you, I think you and I both will have a hard time working for someone like that because you care about the sport just like I do. You wouldn't you wouldn't be a yes man. No, and and, and they don't it, even try. They they don't even try. Outside of saying to me, if this is the sponsor. It's now progressive Bassmaster. Sure. Over there, you got to say sure. it's literally the only guidance. Sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, people want yeah. to paint this picture that bass is this big monster that's hey controlling. They, they honestly, I mean, we had a meeting. Let's be honest, we had a meeting before this first tournament, yep. a production meeting with all the on-air folks, and and it was literally, hey, we need to look at this with an open mind. We yep. need to all talk about it we all have different experiences we all have different feelings and i think the truth is we all also my, my feelings change all you know what i mean it's yeah. all very situational and so you got it or i feel like i need to compliment chase anderson and the, you know, the, the folks at, at bass more yeah. <clears throat> sure money you know you have to pay attention to money and finance when you run a business <coughs> excuse me but it's not I, I i truly think with all my heart and i would never i would never for one second be deceptive about this that chase anderson will make the decision that he thinks is best for the future of bass in the sport and a million dollars and i'm just making up numbers but i don't think a million dollars would sway his decision one second yeah from doing what he thinks is the right thing. <clears throat> Do you? No. I bet you don't. No. I mean, you I look scratch at... scratch. <laughs> get some energy. You want another energy drink? <laughs> yeah, we really need to go to dinner. We do. Um, no. And I, and I think us even saying that, people that feel different are going to, well, of course. And of course we... Sure. But but it the honest truth is... It, and hey, I'm just a loudmouth from Canada. I also don't think that, dude, you've done enough in this sport that you, I mean, at this point in your life, you, have you to. could, no, You're but, no, but you just you say that, but, but you, I don't think somebody could buy, it's, it's dumb because the, the whole truth of the forward facing and sort of thing is we have literally, we've been asked questions. Yeah. We've, I have literally never. Yeah. Chase has talked to me about a bunch. Mike McKinnon has talked to me about a bunch. The tournament department has talked to me about a bunch. All of us. I mean, yeah. every angle you talk to. But I have been asked more questions than I've ever been told about it. Yeah. Like, Yeah. And like you were saying, uh, it's just, and I appreciate that um, because it's a compliment. And the same with you. You're just, you're just being humble and saying you're just somebody that says words or whatever. It's not. You're... You, you're too good of a man and you have too much about you to sell yourself out for something you don't believe in for the future of this sport. I know that about you and you know that about me and I appreciate that. And it is the truth at this point in our lives. I'm not, I don't have to, I'm not going to sell myself out. It's not, it's not quite my family. It'd be like, you're going to lie to your son. If you could make X amount of dollars, there's no way on the face of earth. I would ever do that. And I'm not saying it's to that level, but other than my faith and my family, you know, fishing and, and the, the organization and the blessings I've had being able to pursue my dream, they matter to me. They yeah. matter to me. I'm not going to sell it out for something. I'm, a, I'm not that guy, and you're not either. And if you were, let's be honest, if you were going to sell it out, we would have been sold five years ago. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Dinner time. Of, yeah, we would have, could have, but we did. I love working with you, dude. Love working with we you have a lot of fun. We do. And we're going to have some more fun because we're going to dinner. Tell Bob Cobb to take it away, Davey. Take it away, Bob Cobb. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?